All right, good morning. Welcome um, to the 2022 Ashtekar Frontiers of Science Lectures presented by the Everly College of Science. I am Miguel Mostafa, the Associate Dean for Research and Innovation in the Everly College of Science. And it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you today. Uh, this lecture series was founded by Professor Abai Ashtekar, who is the founding director of the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos and a member of the National Academy of Science. Uh, the series also owes its success to Barbara Kennedy, who presided over the series during its first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in Pennsylvania. Uh, today's lecture is presented by the Simplify team uh, from the Penn State College of Medicine. Simplify is a natural language processing based tool being developed to improve the readability of patients facing communication from uh, physicians. Poor health literacy has had tremendous societal and economic consequences. Simplify aims to advance health equity, improve patient outcomes, and decrease the financial burden of healthcare by making communication simpler. We will let the team members introduce themselves throughout the lecture. And remember that you can post the questions during the presentation using the question and answers uh, button there in your screen. Uh, the floor is yours, guys. Thank you so much for that introduction. We are Penn State Simplify. We're a group of seven individuals, including Neha Gupta, Dr. Ravi Shah, myself, Alyssa Twan, our advisor, Dr. Jennifer Krasniewski, David Foley, Nathan Cannon, and Dr. Christian Park, who came together to compete in the first annual Big Ten Augmented Intelligence Bowl hosted by the Institute for Augmented Intelligence in Medicine at Northwestern University. We represented Penn State and competed against several other universities, and we were tasked with creating a solution using artificial intelligence to address a health disparity. This was a two-part event last year occurring in April and October, and our team, Penn State, won first place. And so today in our talk, we want to talk a little bit about what we developed, um, as well as the health disparity issue we aim to address, which is health literacy. In today's talk, we're also going to talk generally about artificial intelligence in healthcare and also in relation to health equity. And then we'll get to introducing to you all the solution we created, which we call Simplify. Last, we'll end by talking about future directions in AI and healthcare. So first I'm going to tell you about um, health literacy and health disparities to provide you with information about the um, issue in more detail. So health literacy is an important predictor of health status and it affects about nine out of 10 adults in the US according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's defined by the degree to which individuals have the ability to um, find, understand and use information and services to inform health related decisions and actions for themselves and others. Most health related literature such as patient education materials are often written at a readability level that is too high for their intended recipients. Who is affected by health literacy? It, as we just said, affects most US adults. And it's also associated with a range of social and individual factors. And this includes general literacy, where one lives, education and employment status, income, health insurance coverage, and more. So for this reason, certain populations may be more adversely affected than others by the issue. Research shows, and in fact, research do, does show that certain groups are more affected by health literacy than others. Research shows that 20% of, of adults read at a fifth grade reading level or below. Data from the U.S. Department of Education showed in 2017 that Black and Hispanic American populations had a lower reading level compared to white Americans. And data from the CDC also showed that Asian Americans also were more likely to fall into a lower health literacy grouping. Seniors and young adults were also found to have the lowest health literacy compared to other groups. 
And this is really important because seniors, um, they are especially more likely to use more healthcare services, have more chronic conditions, and also take more medications. Last, populations enrolled in the Medicare and Medicaid insurance programs had below basic health literacy, double that of the overall population. And so I highlight these groups here on the slide to show what research indicates are groups that may be adversely affected by health literacy. And this highlights groups who could potentially benefit from health literacy interventions, especially seniors who tend to use more healthcare services. I'd like to talk to you now about the readability of hospital discharge summaries and their impact on health outcomes. At many healthcare institutions, discharge summaries have a section for the patient, providing them with instructions to follow after they leave the hospital to continue their care. Individuals with limited health literacy can encounter barriers to understanding the material um, in these instructions, and this could lead to issues with their health outcome or maybe cause them to return to the hospital. And in fact, Research does show that discharge summaries are read, written at too high of a reading level for patients. For example, in one emergency department, the average reading levels of patients was at the sixth grade reading level, but the discharge instructions were printed at the 11th grade reading level. Research also shows that patients may overestimate their perceived understanding of the instructions compared to what they actually can understand. And it, these all can lead to increased hospitalization and use of the emergency department due to maybe poor understanding about their follow-up appointments or how they should be um, completing their care at home. One study did show that an intervention to improve the readability of discharge summaries did have a positive impact on health outcomes. In a study by Chaudhry et al., the research team was able to improve the readability of discharge instructions by breaking up long sentences, changing complex terms, and assessing the content with readability calculators. And as a result, the study team found that the 30-day patient readmission was reduced by 50%. And so this study provides evidence that interventions related to the readability um, of discharge summaries can work to improve patient health outcomes. Health literacy not only impacts health outcomes, but can also come at a significant cost to payers. The Medicare and Medicaid populations have the worst health literacy rates as we um, already discussed, and interventions could prevent 1 million hospital visits and reduce costs according to uh, studies. Um, and another study also showed that improved health literacy could save more than 25 billion for the Medicare program each year. Last, there are national initiatives that currently aim to address the issue of health literacy. Healthy People 2030 focuses on tackling health literacy in part by increasing people's understanding of their medical records. The Joint Commission, which is an institution that accredits healthcare facilities, has embedded the concept of health literacy into several requirements as part of that process. And last, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality provides resources for healthcare providers to help address barriers in health literacy. And so with that, I'd like to pass the mic on to my colleague, Christian Park. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence is being utilized in healthcare today. Uh, within the last decade, artificial intelligence has been used uh, in many different industries. Um, and, you know, honestly, if you're not integrating AI, it's a little irresponsible. Uh, in medicine, artificial intelligence has grown exponentially. And this can be seen in the amount of investment being poured into it. The global AI health market is currently valued at $8.23 billion and expected to grow to $194 billion by 2030. That's a 38.1 compound annual growth rate. And you certainly know, don't need a business degree to know that's ex extraordinary growth. Within medicine, one of the first fields to be affected by artificial intelligence was medical imaging, specifically radiology. As a radiologist, I've been able to see firsthand the tremendous capabilities of AI for the, lesion, for the uses of lesion detection, organ segmentation, and predictive cancer diagnosis. While I've always been an artificial intelligence maximist, there were some computer scientists that were even more hopeful than I was, as you'll see by this video. And next one. Um, let me start by just saying a few things that seem obvious. Um, I think if you work as a radiologist, 
you're like the coyote that's already over the edge of the cliff but hasn't yet looked down so doesn't realize there's no ground underneath him. Um, people should stop training radiologists now. It's just completely obvious that within five years, um, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists because it's going to be able to get a lot more experience. All right. So that didn't age well. That was done in a 2016. Radiologists are still here. We have jobs. Uh, that was actually Jeffrey Hinton. He's uh, known as the godfather of AI due to his work on convolutional networks at the University of Toronto, and he's brilliant. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, back in 2016, he wasn't the only one that thought radiologists wouldn't have a job, uh, and, and certainly many radiologists lived in fear of uh, not having a job in 2021. Uh, I personally have known for a long time that artificial intelligence would augment the capabilities of physicians and never replace the role of one, but I might be biased, though. Uh, so here's just a few examples, uh, definitely not an exhaustive list about how uh, AI is being used in medicine today. Uh, we talked a little bit about lesion detection within radiology and what this means use, is uh, using computer vision, specifically com uh, convolutional neural networks to detect tumors and uh, particular imaging modalities, such as CTs, X-rays, MRIs, um, you know, increasing specificity, sensitivity. Uh, within, within the treatment, uh, within the realm of treatment prediction, uh, we can actually use these uh, AIs to predict how tumors respond to drugs uh, based on the radio signatures or imaging features of a particular tumor. Uh, one of the most exciting uses of AI um, that has actually probably affected the world uh, very recently is acceleration of drug development uh, from enabling the development of novel vaccines in a fraction of time it did in the past to being able to trial drugs and simulate the effects of billions of molecular structures on various diseases uh, con and conditions. The future of drug development with the help of AI is uh, very exciting. Robotics and prosthetics harness the power of AI for fine motor movements, and the list goes on. Artificial intelligence can predict breast cancer risk better than any of the statistical models that were developed within the last 30 years. It can optimize workflows, reducing burnout and click fatigue among providers. Uh, as well as consolidate all the medical knowledge that we've ever known to mankind and synthesize their diagnosis within seconds, uh, you know, such as I am, IBM Watson, they did sell it off. Uh, and of course, natural language processing, which is the core of our own product, Simplify. Clearly the role of artificial intelligence within medicine will only continue to increase. Uh, and ultimately it'll improve the health of patients and assist in discovering therapies for diseases that were previously untreatable. So a quick word of caution then, uh, the widespread adoption of these kinds of new technologies poses serious questions about how they're actually going to be integrated into the daily operation of the healthcare system. And it would be a mistake to think that our investment in this kind of technology uh, begins and ends with developing it rather than continually monitoring and maintaining it. So at present, we still really lack strong legal frameworks and oversight for the use of this kind of thing. Um, and this is not just a bureaucratic formality. People are often eager to get their technology out there and deployed and making a difference. But health systems that are using these technologies need to have systems in place for understanding when the technology isn't reliable and preferably before it results in unacceptable patient outcomes, right? You want to be proactive, not reactive in this case. Uh, there's a great illustration of this fact that occurred rather recently. Uh, there was a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine that describes the case of a model for detecting sepsis, which was developed by Epic Systems and was in use at the University of Michigan Hospital. And in early 2020, this model started giving spurious results and they ultimately, the oversight board at the hospital decided to deactivate it. So why is there this sudden change in the quality of a model that had already been validated and was already in use? Uh, the answer is a machine learning system's ability to generalize always depends on the representativeness, <clears throat> excuse me, of the data that it was trained on. Um, and if you remember early 2020, something happened. Uh, this model, like every other model, had not been trained on a patient population that was experiencing a COVID pandemic. And the sudden prevalence of the coronavirus made the model's predictions of sepsis unreliable. Uh, now, in this case, this happened very fast, but uh, similar kinds of changes in the patient population can take place very slowly. 
And if the prevalence of diseases ebb and flow over the decades, tools for predicting apparently unrelated diseases can deteriorate. So the lesson here is that we are never really done developing these tools. Uh, if an algorithm today proves incredibly useful in some clinical setting, uh, that's not proof it's gonna be just as accurate in 10 years. So uh, it might be true that AI is able to transform healthcare, uh, but contrary to what Jeffrey Hinton might think, uh, it's not going to practice it all on its own. So next, we are gonna take a look at the intersection of AI and health equity. Healthcare, healthcare represents one of the largest areas of expansion for AI due to the vast wealth of data available. But it's also important to use this technology in a socially responsible way by paying attention to equity. When talking about equity in healthcare, it's important to distinguish between health equality and health equity. This graphic does a good job of explaining the difference. Equality means everyone gets the same thing. So in the graphic, there's a tall man, a medium height child, and a smaller child. All of them are trying to view the baseball game over the fence. If we treat them all equally, each gets their own crate, but the problem is the shortest can't see while the tall man clears the top by a mile. Equity involves principles of justice, where scarce resources, the crates in this graphic, are distributed according to need. This holds true with issues of health equity. So if you have a scarce resource, like say a vaccine for COVID-19, which were initially hard to come by, the principle of equity would say you should prioritize delivering vaccines to populations which have historically had less access to healthcare, even to the point of potentially sidelining some interests of others. This makes sure each people group meets a baseline standard of care in the present. Each can see over the fence, so to speak. The problem is when we're not focused on equity, the reality of what happens is usually the opposite. You can see in the third picture, the smaller child is in a trough well, the tall man has extra crates, so he towers over the fence. The same thing happens in healthcare. In the last two decades, the gap between US rural and urban mortality rates has tripled. Those without a college degree live five years less on average than those who have one. And the difference in life expectancy between patients in the highest and lowest income levels is upward of 14 years. And these inequities are reflected in the real life data used in AI applications. This is one of the biggest challenges to creating socially responsible AI applications in healthcare. For instance, let's say we're creating an AI algorithm to predict which patients are at risk for diabetes. Say a certain demographic of patients, we'll call them group A, often has diabetes, but does not get the treatment they need. If you train the algorithm to predict risk, based on who has come in for treatment, your algorithm will not capture the needs of group A and will underpredict their risk of diabetes. It would perpetuate a health inequity. One solution to this problem is to make corrections for inequities in the data. Going back to the previous example, one might accommodate group A by adding a manual correction to the algorithm that predicts they are at higher risk for diabetes. However, a concern about this method is that oftentimes the factors that put a particular demographic at higher risk are multifactorial and complex. They might include cultural, educational, geographic, or other external factors. Addressing only one factor, such as race or ethnicity, may cause the algorithm to make broad assumptions about the demographic as a whole. This can lead to untrue generalizations about individuals in that group, resulting in potential overtreatment or false assumptions, and it can even cause us to miss other high-risk risk patients outside of that demographic. So while this method may relieve some inequities, there's still room for improvement. So what is the best way to tackle health inequities with AI in healthcare? Ideally, the solution doesn't focus on correction factors or even demographics per se, but on the root problem itself. In the graphic here, that means taking down the fence. In a second, we're presenting our AI solution called Simplify, aimed at alleviating inequities from disparities in health literacy. We came up with Simplify to decrease the gap between patient reading proficiency and discharge instruction reading levels. One way to do this is to help increase patients' reading proficiencies. 
but we also saw no logical reason why discharge instructions should be written at such high reading levels in the first place. Instead of increasing everyone else's reading level, we decided to target decreasing the instructions reading level for patients. This will benefit the educationally disadvantaged most from the decreased threshold, promoting health equity by attacking a systemic root problem. So as Nathan mentioned, our solution is simplify. An artificial intelligence and natural language processing based tool to be integrated into electronic medical records to improve the readability of discharge instructions. We plan to reduce health disparities by improving patients' understanding of their discharge instructions following a hospital stay to ultimately reduce preventable hospital readmissions. Our goal is to empower patients to take control of their health outcomes as they navigate the health system. It'll allow better understanding of their medical conditions, medication dosing instructions, and timeline for follow-up. Our vision for Simplify, which is on the next slide, uh, has five pillars. Uh, better readability of patient-facing facing communication, improved outcomes, uh, transparency for patients, patient empowerment and engagement, and improving health through communication. And here we just gave a couple of examples of the translations that our final iteration of the algorithm will be able to perform. So if you look at, for example, uh, simply uh, instead of a cardiologist, it would direct, uh, directly reference a doctor's name. Uh, even I get confused with my specialist names with so many of them. So this is especially useful for someone that may not be used to navigating uh, the healthcare environment. Uh, in the next example, You'll see that sometimes wording and abbreviations make understanding certain phrases difficult. Here, the algorithm eliminates confusing abbreviations and clarifies the instructions. In the final example, you'll see that the word persists is considered too difficult for many, uh, meaning that uh, it's above the fifth grade reading level and uh, would you know, cause confusion if someone's not uh, you know, understanding of that particular phrase, word. And subsequently, it's converted into more understandable text, which will lead to better outcomes. Uh, now we'll look at uh, you know, uh, the specific UI UX, uh, which is critical um, you know, for the provider uh, in that it must be both familiar and, prov and uh, provide ease of use. Uh, we know a lot of times uh, the difficulty and sometimes of these AI tools is the adoption amongst providers uh, because of the incidence of uh, quick fatigue and uh, you know, using a simplified and uh, standardized UI UX uh, will be able to reduce that. Um, additionally, using the HL7 FHIR standard, Simplify will be both EMR agnostic and allowed for uh, broad interoperability, which means we won't be uh, sequestered into just using uh, specific EMRs uh, and be able to broaden the accessibility uh, for providers. And uh, in terms of data flow, uh, we've been working very hard with our internal Cerner team, and we've streamlined the process of exporting the original data from the EMR, applying the algorithm, and inserting the modified version seen here. So the technology that underlies Simplify is uh, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence transformer model trained to imitate our human simplifiers. Uh, so this is basically framed as a machine translation task. Um, we do leverage several data augmentation techniques uh, based on the SNOMED CT ontology. So SNOMED CT is a medical terminology ontology uh, that relates terms to synonyms uh, and also relates them to higher level concepts in a hierarchy. Um, and we can use this to introduce uh, substitution based strategies uh, to create a bigger sample size of our training data and to try to cover uh, a wider swath of the vocabulary. Um, there are still some limitations, though. Um, at present, uh, we had something like 300 some simplified discharge instructions, uh, which is a low sample size for these sort of modern machine translation techniques. Uh, we do gain some additional power by pre-training on a corpus of simple English Wikipedia. Um, but this is data from a very different source. Um, it's not exactly the same quality. It doesn't have the same kind of vocabulary. Um, but nevertheless, the model is able to learn some meaningful improvements in reading level of the language in many cases. So, uh, yeah, so here on this slide, 
we can see some metrics of how the model performs in aggregate, uh, but we uh, need to be very careful interpreting what we're looking at here. So readability here, this is the flesh Kincaid score. Um, and that is a readability metric that does not take semantics into account. So it's very important in interpreting what we're looking at here, right? So when we see a, a lower number for AI simplifications, that is not evidence that the AI is better at simplifying the language of a discharge instruction than a human. Uh, what it does show is that the AI is less wordy. It's not outputting needlessly long sentences. Right? It's a sanity check, uh, but it's not a substitution for actually looking at and evaluating the quality of the substitutions that it's suggesting. Um, on the right, what we can see is how the model is improved as we acquire more simplified instructions. So a part of the process of developing this is actually building out the data set, which is one of the most valuable parts of the project in the first place. Um, so uh, what we're seeing here is the cross entropy, which is a measure of how well the model predicts the human simplification um, on a word by word basis. So given the rate of improvement, uh, we're pretty confident that as we build out the proprietary data set further and further, our model will continue to improve towards deployment quality. Um, so uh, we can look at the next slide. Yeah, our, our simplified text database is the first of its kind in healthcare. Like I said, the uh, literature that exists on automatic text simplification depends on relatively low quality data sets. And in any machine learning and artificial intelligence task, data is king. So with this in mind, uh, we have really set out to create a robust multi-specialty simplified library that is reviewed by licensed physicians for accuracy of the simplification. Uh, and this in itself is really a marketable product. Uh, Simplify can also be used to evaluate all patient facing materials. Right? We focus on discharge instructions now, but we can expand it to patient portal communication, information on medical apps, uh, you know, popular medical websites. Um, in the future, we hope to be able to adjust text to regionality and reading level by patient preference. I mean, we talk about uh, uh, equity and different populations and being concerned about how shifts in the population might change over time. But this applies to language as well. And it's something that has to be continually monitoring, as I said. <laughs> so uh, let's recap. Simplify addresses a major healthcare disparity by automatically enhancing the readability of discharge instructions. And by targeting avoidable readmissions and facilitating more robust communications, uh, we strive to reduce overall costs and improve patient outcomes, ultimately simplifying healthcare for our most vulnerable populations. We've talked a little bit about how AI is already changing healthcare and about Simplify's approach to making patient provider communication clear. We wanted to introduce you to what the next 10 years in healthcare will look like with increasing artificial intelligence and machine learning integration. So going through the financial implications and major considerations, there's been a massive amount of investment in organizations building out artificial intelligence capabilities and startups engineering new use cases. Just in 2021, there were $2.5 billion in new funding solely in healthcare AI startups the market has reached over 7 billion this year. And again, as uh, Christian mentioned earlier, with a growth rate of about 40% per year. There are a couple of big overarching themes that will account for much of the discussion over the next few years. These include data quality and regulation. AI can only learn from data it is provided. Inherently, there's a risk for bias. Like we spoke about earlier, irresponsible data aggregation without a focus and data quality can lead to skewed algorithms. In the case of healthcare, this can severely impact patient quality of life and care. Further, the regulatory framework behind artificial intelligence-based technology approval is also in development and needs robust funding and support to protect patients from poorly developed algorithms. We'll take a look next at how artificial intelligence is on the forefront of revolutionizing several sectors of healthcare, namely patient-focused, clinical-focused, administrative, and research and product development using AI methodologies. It will be important to remember that AI will not replace your doctor, your nurse, or your pharmacist, but rather it will offer support to strain workforces, automate repetitive tasks, and make for safer care. Next slide. 
So on a uh, patient-focused note, this is by no means an exhaustive list of patient-facing AI applications, but a sampling of what is possible. Active predictive analytics and patient-specific remote monitoring become more palatable as we're able to analyze the huge amounts of data coming from the wearable and remote monitoring devices that patients already have. This includes smart watches, implantable cardiac devices like pacemakers and ICDs, sleep apnea machines, glucose monitors, there are many, many more. This data can be used to predict patients who are more likely to need interventions or present to the hospital. Support devices for physical therapy that allow patients to rehab more actively at home are on the horizon now. These are devices that can detect gait patterns and support motions when needed. Chronic care management is another huge field. It accounts for about 90% of total health expenditures. What we'll be able to do is to reduce the burden uh, that chronic care management places on the healthcare system. Local and personal genomic analysis to help screen patients for genetic disorders has and will continue to become cheaper and more accessible. You can think to yourself about 23andMe. From a clinician-focused perspective, artificial intelligence applications are designed to improve diagnosis, allow physicians to spend more time with patients, reduce medical errors, and reduce physician burnout. For example, a popular company called Nuance Technologies was recently acquired by Microsoft for almost $20 billion. While they have a portfolio of products, one of the most interesting research projects they had was developing a system that could listen ambiently to physician interactions with patients and create documentation from that. If it's successful in an applicable manner, this would save physicians and other providers countless hours of documentation. Another developing tool is electronic medical record integrated physician recommendations for diagnosis and treatment. This system would be able to process clues from the visit and suggest appropriate diagnoses and treatment recommendations by the physician. There may also come a time when diagnostic testing becomes more automated. Imagine having an ultrasound or an echocardiogram that is conducted largely by a robotic arm instead of a human sonographer. The image could then also be preliminarily interpreted by AI software to be finalized by a human doctor. Future artificial intelligence systems may also be able to review records in order to find patterns that do not fit the standard of treatment. This would help in preventing medical error and again, provide better treatment recommendations. Finally, from a billing perspective, improving documentation can more accurately capture physician services for information sharing and reporting. Now we talk about the administrative uses of AI in healthcare. So one in three healthcare dollars are spent on administrative processes. The American Hospital Association Center for Health Innovation found that about 40% of tasks performed by non-clinical staff can be assigned to AI. And about 33% of clinical tasks can also be assigned to AI. In the outpatient setting, you may one day have a kiosk instead of a front desk. It will be able to process all the information the physician needs, including your ID, your insurance, your past medical history. Within the hospital, hospital supplies and, and supply chain management is an enormously resource intensive process. Not only can AI be used to reduce waste and save money, but it can also be used to identify vulnerabilities, automate uh, orders, and based on inventory needs can reduce downtime and dramatically decrease administrative burden. Something you've probably heard of is called prior authorization. It is the bane of many physicians' existence. Insurance companies have an undue role in dictating medicines, tests, and procedures physician can order for their patients, but it is the system that we're working within. Justified orders can often be turned down because of excessive documentation needs and difficulty in having a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. This is when a physician speaks for another physician on the insurance company's end. There are systems that can automatically send the needed documentation, which have already become a reality, and they will start becoming more prevalent in the future. Finally, Calling patients with reminders for appointments, medication refills, dosing schedules is also a very resource-heavy uh, resource task. Systems will one day be able to process all of this 
through software and dramatically reduce administrative burden. Finally, let's briefly talk about how AI impacts research and development of new products. These include new medications and new devices. Since monoclonal antibody treatments have been discovered, the world of medicine has dramatically changed. Identifying candidate protein structures and further, even candidates based on genomic analysis becomes exponentially easier with the help of AI. The process of new drug development can take a little over a decade and billions of dollars in R&D funding. By improving the likelihood for drug success, we have the possibility of reducing costs, having more drugs approved, and having companies focus on diseases that do not already have large financial interests. Last but not least, can we predict the next pandemic? Can we look at what patients are presenting for to the ED and figure out patterns? Can we monitor bacteria and viruses in wastewater to figure out the presence of new concerning illnesses? The sheer amount of data that needs to be processed used to be a rate limiting step. This may soon change and no longer be the case. Let's recap. Poor health literacy is a leading health disparity that has been linked to poor health outcomes. We can re help reduce the impact of poor health literacy by improving the readability of patient resources and instructions. Artificial intelligence technologies can help improve the practice of medicine in multiple ways. But there are significant pitfalls, and these must be addressed before AI tools become more mainstream, specifically relating to data quality based in equity and justice, regulation of new technologies and approvals, and the iterative learning process that happens as AI tools acquire more data. The next decade, we'll see a revolution in the practice of medicine due to AI. So thank you. We really, really appreciate your time. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I always have the pleasure that I'm the one that can clap for everybody else. <laughs> uh, thank you guys, this was great. Uh, there are already some really good questions that I'm gonna read you. Um, and I have some of my own too, but uh, so I'll, I'll read you the first question that is very related to one that I had, but, uh, and in the meantime, you guys can, the audience can keep posting more questions if, if you have them. Uh, so the, I'll read you the question and then I'll tell you my question. <laughs> I think that um, this is probably for Christian, but you guys can pick who, who answers. Can you give some analysis or comments why Hinton was wrong in his prediction that deep learning technology would replace radiology soon? And before you answer that question, I, I tell you what my question was. It's like, when you say he's wrong, what do you mean? You mean that that will never happen or he just was wrong in the prediction on when it will happen? So will it ever happen or not? <laughs> so. Then you're going to answer that question. <laughs> oh, no, I, I like it. I like it. You know, it, this, this is a question that comes up like a million times. And uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, stakeholders involved, right? Um, you know, radiologists, uh, I think, you know, physicians as a whole, uh, the medical industry. Uh, you know, I, I'd say that, let me to answer the question about uh, Jeffrey Hinton first. Um, I think that um, his prediction about being wrong is uh, more of a time aspect. Uh, so to be clear, you know, the, the, the five years, I, I think there's this theory that uh, a lot of times when we evaluate new technology, we overestimate the capabilities that come um, in the short term, but then underestimate the capabilities that come even longer term. So, um, you know, I think that um, not just in medicine, but just overall in all industries, uh, there is a true, uh, you know, there's concerns and maybe like a hopefulness about a lot of things that are currently being done by humans being automated. Um, I think though that is, there's a lot of development to be done, um, uh, not to mention a lot of regulation. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, in the long term, I, th I certainly think that's a possibility, um, you know, whether it's radiologists, whether it's truck drivers, whether it's, you know, uh, even a lot of these high skilled uh, different applications, I think over time we will get artificial intelligence to be able to take over the roles uh, that are, you know, somewhat repetitive and, you know, even highly skilled. 
Uh, and that's because of the development of, you know, the hard work of the computer scientists, continued uh, development of algorithms. And, uh, you know, looking a little, even uh, a little bit further, you look at quantum computing and what that allows, um, I think that's a possibility. So, uh, you know, to summarize, I think Jeffrey Hinton was wrong in his timing, but right, he, I think that sentiment will be right in the long term, uh, you know, for my career sake, probably even longer term. Um, I think just in medicine in general, uh, and, and certainly in radiology tools, I mean, there's a lot of regulatory issues that, you know, uh, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. I, and I don't know if people have, you know, been looking at the uh, Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes uh, kind of, uh, you know, sequence and lawsuit. And, and that was because a lot of times the same principles that you use within development uh, and uh, venture capital in, in the companies that deal with healthcare is very different because you're, you know, we're working with patients, right? So you can't kind of take this approach of, you know, just fake it till you make it. And so a lot of with a lot of these algorithms, um, you have to get to a, a specific performance level before we feel comfortable applying it within the clinic. Additionally, uh, as David and uh, Ravi mentioned, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles, you know, at the FDA, you know, it's a new entity for them. We, um, we've done, you know, drugs for a long time. But how do you uh, regulate, uh, you know, out, uh, AI technology with this big black box aspect, right? Uh, that's a big issue that we need to elucidate. Uh, we have some techniques uh, using um, like grad cams and using heat, uh, kind of like uh, heat maps, to be able to kind of uh, understand what the algorithm is looking at. Uh, but that still, you know, needs clarity. So I, I think there's that, and then also I think the bigger kind of more uh, business aspect is we have all these startups and, and Ravi was saying, you know, how, how all this money was being uh, funneled into these startups. But if you kind of look at it as a business model, if a hospital system, let's say, asks a startup to, you know, work with them to come up with a model, go through this expensive integrated process in their EMR, and two years down the line, the company you know, folds or they run out of funding. Well, then you spend all this investment and, you know, now you're gonna start from, you know, uh, square one. So, you know, there's, there's th those sorts of uh, dynamics that make it difficult, but uh, what I've seen kind of recently and uh, with the maturation of the market is that the, um, the more mature players that are coming up uh, have been uh, being able to be integrated within uh, radiology practices. And I think more and more I've seen, um, you know, kind of acceptance uh, from radiologists and using these tools and, um, you know, and, and actually they've been working really great for us in terms of, using NLP to uh, come up with, uh, you know, automatic impressions, uh, doing some simple um, lesion detection. Um, so, you know, I think the future is bright for AI and uh, for the short term, at least, I think it'll be uh, a great way to augment uh, physician uh, capabilities. I'll just make one more point to that. So yes. when we practice medicine, we always interpret uh, studies and lab results, imaging results in context. And, and that's what's really important. What we have to develop over time, and this is probably on the order of five, 10, 15 years, is providing that context to these AI systems. And when they give you probabilities of, uh, well, can it, be, can it be a heart failure or is it, uh, is it a heart attack, right? A lot of that happens in relation to what the patient is telling you, not simply the lab tests. And so inputting that data uh, is a big challenge. Uh, how do you acquire that data in a reliable manner on a patient-to-patient -patient basis? Because we're all different, and it's, it's, it's a beauty of humanity. And once we're able to do that uh, and do it accurately, we'll be able to work even more synergistically with these new technologies. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have to say that I Respectfully disagree. <laughs> I, uh, I think I think that all this technology it's amazing and it will always enhance and improves the outcome and uh, and everything. But you can't compare with a truck driver, and uh, I think that the truck driver should worry about his job, but the radiologist shouldn't. We should keep training radiologists and. And they should be able to. In fact, you have to train them beyond the the the, the current training. They, you have to train them to understand the AI 
and be able to use it to do a better job even that they're doing. And I tell you a couple of examples. One is what I was thinking. I, I've been using uh, contact lenses for more than 30 years. And every time I go to the eye doctor every year, and the first thing that they do, they put you in a machine that measures what is the, the magnification that you need, the, the all the prescription. And, and you could say, well, that machine gives me a ticket and that has the prescription. In the last 30 years, that's not the prescription that I take out from my doctor. I take the one that he says, and it's different from what the machine said. And you know, this has been doing it for many, many years. And, and it's a great tool. And he starts from there. And then we, we look at a lot of different details that are very, very difficult to, to make the training. And there's another question that we'll get into the training and testing of this AI <laughs> specifically. But there's there's another comment from uh, Dana Reed in the in the chat that says that you know uh, uh, she her father uh, is 93 and, and new to technology, hard for him and to adapt to it and 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 her help is needed for utilizing some of the medical technology and it's helpful and she so it's, it's more what Ravi was saying that you know people had to use this too so uh that you know so my prediction and i could be wrong is that <laughs> you are not going to be out of the job anytime soon <laughs> I, I like i like your thinking i like your thinking. <laughs> just one uh one quick analogy here yes. and to show the progression of how medicine has evolved. So when stethoscopes came out, it was revolutionary, right? You had a way and you had a window uh, to look into the, into the body with your ears, right? You could, uh, and those heart sounds and the murmurs and rubs and along with your physical exam gave you a way to interpret what was going on in the body, right? By not actually having to do a procedure. The next step to that was ultrasound. And we, have, we, we now have echocardiograms. And they can very precisely tell us you know, what the function of the heart is, what the, the different valves are doing, what the pressures are in the heart even, all non-invasively. But even with the best ultrasound, it doesn't always tell you how the patient is doing. And what cardiologists and all the other healthcare professionals have done is as new tools have come out, they've used it to augment their decision-making capacity. And in the next decade, that's what we're going to see. We're not going to be replacing anybody so quickly, but I think also to, uh, to know what Christian said, on the order of 15, 20, 25 years, the capacity of computing is, is going to rise exponentially. Um, and so it's going to be an entirely different framework. So the next question, thank you for that comment. Uh, the, the next question, it might be for David, but you guys, again, you pick. So the question is, how do you ensure that Simplify does not change the intent of the discharge documents? Yeah, this, this is the most important question, right? <laughs> um, and in fact, I think that uh, our approach to this is not actually at the level of uh, the algorithm for making translations necessarily, although there are things you can do there to try and improve the model. But um, the most important thing is making sure the human is in the loop. And so the way in which Simplify, um, it, we see it being used is uh, almost like uh, the way that Microsoft Word makes suggestions, right, to altering what you've written, right, because you made a spelling mistake, because you made a grammar mistake, not something that automatically changes as you type, but something that highlights something that's there that either the physician wrote, or that, you know, maybe this is uh, something that's analyzing the boilerplate text that will be go out. And then an actual medical professional will look at what was highlighted and suggested, right, and maybe it'll say, uh, this reading level is just too high, won't make a suggestion. Maybe it'll actually suggest some altered language at a lower reading level. But someone will have to confirm that, right? This is not something where the technology is the last thing to touch a document before it goes into a patient's hands. And we would never want it to be that way. E even if we thought we could trust the technology pretty well, um, 
that's the sort of thing that, I mean, first of all, legally, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but there's a good reason for that too, right? So um, I think that keeping the actual medical experts in the loop is, is the most important element uh, for that kind of thing. Thank you. Another question about the, the user interface. Uh, while the wording is a bit, it's, uh, sorry, the things move. <laughs> while the wording is at the more appropriate reading level, the layout samples appear text heavy. I saw some relatively long paragraphs in the example, and this can overwhelm readers at a lower level. Does the Simplify program incorporate infographics or assist with the formatting to include more white space like bullet points, et cetera? Uh -huh, so, I can speak to yeah. so uh, the, this is kind of version one. This is where we want to make sure that the fundamental technology behind this works. In the future, we've, we've discussed about inter integrating infographics. Uh, text size, text spacing, uh, discharge document formats. And so a, a lot will be integrated uh, into version two and version three. But initially this is a, a proof of concept. Thank you. Then I have two similar questions. So I'm gonna put both of them here. So the first one is, are, are you using Simplify now at Penn State Hershey? And the other one is, uh, thank you. I live in the Johns Hopkins area. Uh, do you collaborate with Hopkins? Uh, so I would just take that one. I mean, we're not, so currently, you know, as, as Robbie said, this is version one. And, uh, you know, in terms of clinical use, I think we are still uh, many steps away from utilizing this within the clinic. Um, that being said, uh, we're, we're working with Cerner and we're to be able to integrate this uh, efficiently with the EMR, which is the first step, and be able to see how that uh, directly uh, within kind of, a, kind of a testing scenario, how that directly results in you know, revenue uh, you know, savings. Uh, you know, and then of course, you know, the most important thing is uh, seeing what the patient feedback is, you know, or the end user, and to see that what, what tweaks we need to do. So, uh, the answer to that is no, we're not using them uh, in, in, a, in a clinical uh, in clinical use context currently, but uh, you know, we will be, we're testing currently and hopefully we get to that level pretty, uh, very soon. Um, in terms of uh, the Hopkins questions, we aren't collaborating with Hopkins. Uh, we're collaborating and we're, you know, we're, we're, typically, we're just, you know, kind of uh, working with Penn State uh, by our, ourselves currently, but um, you know, I think one of the things moving forward, um, you know, we talked about the health equities, you know, how do we, uh, you know, one of the issues, uh, I think, with, you know, these uh, natural language processing um, you know, algorithms is being able to represent um, different patient populations from all over the United States. And being able to do that is uh, certainly uh, being able to include training data that represents different populations, uh, different accents, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, particular uh, ways of, of speaking. So, you know, I, right now there isn't collaboration, but we'd love to. Uh, and I think that ultimately the collaboration will, you know, allow our uh, Simplify product to be more broad and apply to more patients overall. Thank you. So I, I, there's another comment. Uh, uh, it says, as a retired physician, um, the biggest complaint I get is that the healthcare is losing the human component and getting very impersonal. There is no replacement to holding the patient's hand and looking them in the eye. Dr. Question. Carver, we agree. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you actually have a, a really good example of how you know, I think when we talk about these products and artificial intelligence, I think the initial reaction is, oh, the machines are going to be doing the jobs of physicians, and uh, and oh, currently, I think patients are, you know, the, when I was, you know, an intern, one of the biggest uh, complaints that I had from patients uh, when they talked to the attendees within the family medicine clinic was, uh, we were the physicians were spending so much time, you know, looking in the computer, um, you know, clicking into it, and uh, rather than making eye contact with patients, which you know, that's not what they're. For they want you know reassurance of the patient, 
they want to you know establish that rapport and uh you know one way you know i think one specific way that i think ai will uh, really help um that i saw that they were doing over at stanford uh very exciting stuff is uh they actually had um you know kind of a way uh, number one they had the conversation being recorded um and then they also had um to kind of augment the accuracy that a camera being kind of uh focused on the physician's mouth. And what that did was um, by getting that conversation and kind of translating that into clinical notes, uh, the physician had to do very minimal actual typing into the EMR. Um, obviously this is not, you know, this is looking a little bit forward, but you know, what that, what I saw was a physician that during the course of the clinical encounter, they were talking to the uh, patient they spent more time, you know, talking about, you know, how the patient felt about it. If they understood the risks uh, of their condition and, and their treatment. And so I think, um, you know, to directly address that question, AI, I think, is not just about making tools to automate certain processes, but also if we, you know, innovate, uh, can really increase and, um, you know, help kind of like that the uh, uh, physician patient interaction. So uh, you know, I think that was a you know, really great way of using technology to uh, help that particular concern. So yeah, I think that that's very for, important. Yeah, go ahead, Ravi. For, for every um, for every hour that I spend seeing a patient or, or patients, I'll spend almost as much time documenting or looking through the electronic medical record, and it, it is enormously burdensome. Uh, we did not go into medicine to look at computers. We wanted to talk to people, to talk to patients, help them. Uh, and this is one of the ways that uh, we can help make patients healthier uh, and also spend more time with them. So I think that this one, uh, we can bring Christian in. So <laughs> um, the question is, what specific steps do you take to keep the AI system from unintentionally ignoring underprivileged groups if there's not as much data available for certain underprivileged groups? I think, I think David, I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit and I think David could definitely, and, and Nathan, I think also, you know, talking about the uh, ethical concerns um, can put his input as well. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, I think when you look at artificial intelligence as a whole, um, you know, uh, people a lot of times talk about the algorithms and, and over at uh, Silicon Valley, we have the smartest, you know, smartest people, um, you know, and obviously at Penn State with David uh, working on these algorithms, we have the smartest people in the world working on these uh, advanced algorithms, improving them all the time. And, you know, even from the time that I've been involved in radiology, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, vast improvements, uh, but the different, but, the, but, but the really the limiting, um, factor that I see, uh, with, um, you know, and this has been talked about, you know, within the AI community is being able to have data sets that are robust and are generalizable throughout the population. And, um, you know, uh, this question is great because that is sometimes what limits the uh, dissemination or the utilization of these uh, particular algorithms uh, in different communities. And, and in fact, um, that's a little bit why, you know, uh, I think as a whole, we're uh, concerned about falling uh, behind some other, within medicine, uh, because of the way that we, our data is sequestered. Um, you know, if you look at a very nationalized, uh, uh, nationalized uh, health systems, just the UK or China, um, all their health data is uh, in one area. So that data can be extracted in a very efficient manner. Uh, whereas for here, a lot of that data is, is sequestered and we do need to make uh, you know, specific uh, data agree agreements and, and be able to you know, uh, pull from different areas. So you know, federated uh, data is, is a huge thing to be able to address exactly what they're talking about. You know, we don't want um, you know, bias and discrimination is a big thing, uh, you know, within medicine. And because the data that we use um, is directly, you know, the training data that we use is directly from that, uh, we want to mitigate that as much as possible. And really to do that is to be able to just, you know, take as much data from all over the country so that, um, you know, when we have a particular 
data set that represents everybody, it has less of that just uh, that bias aspect. And uh, what we've, you know, another method that we found that, that uh, just within uh, different uh, studies is that you can actually take this kind of generalized kind of data set and model. And then when you get to a specific um, area, you can use what is called a transfer learning to have the algorithm, um, you know, not only have the, the, learn, the learning, uh, the training that it did on the bigger sample, but uh, be able to train on a smaller sample that's a little bit more representative of that particular area. So, you know, those are the type of things that I'm aware of that we're using to mitigate um, kind of being a, that bias. Um, and, you know, I've seen other things too, you know, actually algorithms that, um, you know, combat bias within an algorithm. So, I mean, there's definitely more complicated mm -hmm. methods, but when it comes to data, I think it's just, uh, you know, the best things to have as much data as possible representing everybody. Yeah, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. So I was, I, I meant to call on Nathan here too. So, oh. <laughs> okay. My, I mean, I have, I have a comment. I'd like to go make, for it. Uh, go for it. I think that, you know, like everything Christian has said about uh, trying to get better data and trying to, you know, mitigate bias is true. But at the end of the day, there is no replacement for actually going out and and testing this, right? I mean, if you can't get your hands on data that actually comes from underprivileged groups or, or groups that just aren't necessarily representing the data for whatever reason, uh, you have to go out and basically do a study and, and see how your technology uh, will affect them, right? I mean, and, and in fact, like this is, this is something we've discussed uh, in the context of Simplify, like what even counts as a simplification is gonna depend on the target audience, right? I mean, somebody who has a low reading level uh, maybe because they're undereducated, is is not necessarily going to find the same kind of language confusing as someone who has a low English reading level because English is their second language, right? Um, and so we just have to look at these groups um, and and do studies on you know show them the simplifications that the technology makes um, and try to assess how well it improves it from the perspective of different populations. We have to identify them. We have to test it. Um, it's not something that we've done yet, but it's something we have to do. Um, and, and even if we did have data, even if we take every step uh, possible to mitigate bias, you'd still have to do this, right? Uh, so that's what I would say. So Nathan, you wanna add something to this or? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think honestly what Christian and David uh, said pretty much kind of summarizes it. Um, and, and to add on to what David was saying, um, that was something that we, we were kind of looking at doing focus, focus groups um, with our Simplify um, you know, algorithm, just to kind of, to kind of field it. I think it's important to field it in the real population, in the real world, and to try and get as diverse a representation um, that, that we are able to when we do that. So I, I think just to kind of echo what Christian and David said. Yeah, so it's good that you guys have it in mind and you're planning on doing. It. I I think that the, it, it's a big challenge because you know if there's no data, if they're not being represented, it's very easy to miss them because there's no data there. So uh, it's a it's a very interesting challenge. So let me ask you a question, Alisa. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that. I, I, I was struck by the 25 billions in savings uh, for, I can't remember if it was Medicare or Medi, uh, uh, one of the systems. W where is the savings? Where, where, where is it that we are saving money? Sure, that savings would come from the reduction in healthcare, hospital readmissions for seniors, um, just costs, um, savings in costs that are, come from healthcare, like medications, um, care for chronic conditions, those, I could look more at the study, but um, that's generally what I believe it was indicating where the savings would come from. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have one last question. About, um, yes, go for it. Sorry. It's not just about the index readmission, right? Okay. It's everything that goes along with it. So now when, when a patient's readmitted, 
that's five days of their life again, right? Or a week of their life again, they're spending in the hospital, they're less productive. There's the quality to, to that even, right? There are different medications they have to be on. There are more tests that are ordered for that reason. So it's a compounded problem. It is, it's not just uh, a patient went home and they had to come back. A patient went home, they had to come back and they had to get 10 more tests. They had to be in the hospital for so many more days. The hospital bed was then not available to somebody who needed it, right? And their care was delayed. Um, the, the, the downstream effects are just tremendous. I see. Thank you. So th there is one last question, I think that is related to the very first one. Uh, there's one person in the audience that disagree with me. Uh, it's the, you know, they say, I think that the current deep learning technology is already better than the human radiologist, but auto driving is a different story and the current technology is not good enough and it will take many more years. So any comments? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> it's like you teed it up for me. Uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, where that sentiment is, that it, the deep learning technology is already better than uh, human radiologists. I think that that comes from, I think, a lot of the, the studies that have uh, come out, uh, you know, uh, within academic circles. And, you know, I, I come from that. Uh, I know Andrew Ng, uh, he's huge uh, out at Stanford. Uh, you know, and when, whenever, whenever they come out with these particular performance indices, um, it has to do with like, you know, the, 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 the studies have to be a certain way and, uh, you know, uh, the patient's perfectly aligned and they're looking for one type of lesion. And there's all of these, you know, when you do experiments, there's very specific things that don't happen in the real world. You know, I can tell you right now in the real world, when you get an x-ray, it's, uh, you know, very difficult to get a perfect x-ray, you know, uh, that's, you know, aligned the center to lateral. There's, you know, everyone has all sorts of chronic conditions, uh, devices, and all these things, you know, make it very difficult for any algorithm to be able to, you know, uh, make a prediction. And so, you know, that's why uh, you don't see AI technology being used uh, within healthcare. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's maybe a little bit of a, you know, sentiment that we don't use it because we don't want to be out of a job or that uh, there's, you know, some conspiracy of that, uh, you know, for, you know, for like coma budites, but that's not true, right? I mean, I think that, you know, as physicians, radiologists, we want to do everything to make the, you know, our patient's lives better. And if there's a tool that'll do that for us, I mean, that's great. And, and, and the way that it stands, uh, not just here, but in Europe, the volume of radiological studies is, is, is just so high. I mean, we, the demand for radiology is, is out of control. So we love it. We love tools to be able to, you know, perform, you know, as, you know, advertised as, you know, better than a radiologist. We just haven't seen that. Um, and, and the reason why you're seeing, uh, and, and it's funny that you say that that question says that the, the actual performance of the, you know, the Tesla auto driving models is very difficult and doesn't work very well because that's, you know, real world deployment. So when you real, when you really deploy that, you know, algorithm, radiology algorithm in the clinical world, you'll find that the, you know, the clinical performance is not very good. And that's why we don't use it. We can't have, you know, um, you know, there's, there's two types of AI. There's one AI that's high risk AI um, that, you know, if something goes wrong, you know, human lives, you know, like you know, if you have a car, you're auto driving, you get someone gets hurt, same thing in medicine. So we have to be very careful about how we interpret, you know, uh, kind of research studies versus actual clinical depo deployment. And, um, you know, I think there's a long way to go before we start deploying these things uh, clinically in a, in, a, in a big way. Um, it'll take time, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, I, you know, I think it's just the same thing with technology. You need to get better. And, you know, over the course of uh, hopefully many, many decades, uh, we will get to a point where we have tools that are very good at, uh, you know, augmenting physicians. So a common phrase that you see in economic analyses and these studies is all else things being equal, right? This is true. And what that means is that in a controlled environment, in controlled circumstances and with controlled variables, you can make a conclusion. Um, that was one of the limitations of original predictive analytics, right? The original data analysis and original statistics 
require you to have certain controls and whatnot. What we see now with, uh, with AI and machine learning is that the algorithms can teach themselves. There's an iterative process by which that, that pattern recognition, that modeling is improving. As you feed that model more and more data, it becomes more and more able to reach that endpoint. But the process in between is not entirely clear. And there's a whole field of research um, that's happening within AI to elucidate what this black box is. Because it, it is important about how that conclusion is reached. And so it's an improvement on, on the old statistics, but there, there is still uh, a ways to go, and especially something like radiology. Right on a mute. Uh, there's a one last quick comment that uh, about what you were saying, Christian, that uh, the volume is so high in radiology because a lot of it is inappropriate and overused. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's not, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. But unfortunately, um, the reason why that exists and, and that, had, you know, completely, it's, it's a different topic. Um, it's because of the way that uh, medicine is performed within medicine uh, is in America. Uh, the whole legal system, we, um, you know, in the ED, uh, well, anywhere, you know, we, we, we use kind of like the, I don't know if I can use the language, but basically we try to cover all our bases because we don't want to miss anything. You know, uh, the patient may come with, come in with a cough. Um, it's probably nothing, but, you know, it could also be cancer, but a very small percentage of cancer. And, you know, if you miss that and it ends up being cancer, I mean, even if the statistics are in your favor, you end up, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, legal issues. So, you know, radiology is one of those tools. We, you know, we have a term for the CT machine. We call it the donut of truth. Um, so a lot of times clinicians have to use imaging to kind of, you know, weather the uh, incidence of whatever serious disease is very low, uh, especially in the ED, right? Because patient comes in with a shortness of breath. They could be anxious, could be nothing, but also could be a massive, uh, pulmonary embolism. So, you know, we get a ton of these studies in the ED um, that uh, are, you know, people may think it's unnecessary, uh, maybe in a statistical model, maybe, but at the end of the day, there's always that small chance and uh, the way that the medical system is structured, uh, sometimes we have to do it. So, um, you know, for better or for worse, um, you know, radiology is used to kind of, you know, put these uh, issues to rest. Thank you. Thank you all very much. This was extremely interesting. So for the rest of us, remember uh, when you leave the webinar, you will either get a post survey immediately in Zoom or in your email in, within the next day. So please, again, take a minute and fill this out. This will help us determine how to make our future lectures more engaging and popular. So thank you. Uh, next week webinar will be at the same time, the same link same channel, same time. Um, the topic will be slightly more technical than our previous ones. Uh, Dr. Jin Chao Yu from the Department of Mathematics will be presenting a mathematical understanding of artificial intelligence. And I'll see you here next week. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>